Hey, this is Michael Carter, lead pastor here at The Life Church, and I just want to thank you for watching this rebroadcast of this week's message. We hope it's in some way an inspiration to you and that there will be things that you can apply to your own life to help you along your journey. I'm really glad that you're wanting to grow in your relationship with Jesus, and I believe the Word of God will help you do just that. So be encouraged, and if there's something in the message that helps you or rings true with you, we'd like you to respond. You can leave a question or a comment or even a prayer request in the comments below. I'm praying for you, and I hope you have an amazing week. Well, listen, if I were to ask you if there was one word that you wanted to use to describe yourself, one word that you wanted to uh, shape your future and form you, one word that you would say, this is my goal moving forward. This is what I would want to be known as. What would that word be? If you had an opportunity to sit and think about what that word would be, what would it be? And there was a guy who was thinking along these lines, and he, he actually asked some people on the street, and he asked some of his friends, you know, what that word would be. And there were about three words that came up time and time again. You know, think about it in your own life. What word would that be? One of the words was successful. Successful. And then another word was influential. And then the third one was happy. Now, I mean, these are good words. If somebody were to ask you, what do you want to, a word to describe your life? I think a lot of us would say successful. I think that's a good thing. I think being successful in life is a good thing. It's something to be achieved. It is something to shoot for. I think being influential uh, is a good word. I mean, everybody, especially young people nowadays, uh, want to be influential. They want to be influencers on Instagram and on Facebook and on TikTok and, uh, you know, and, and people want to be influential. But influential is not a bad word. In fact, John Maxwell, who's a former pastor from Ohio and uh, probably the leader in leadership talks, uh, once said that leadership itself is about influence, nothing more, nothing less, influence. So influence would be a great thing. That's something to achieve. And I mean, come on, guys. Who doesn't want to be happy, right? This, that's what we want to do. We want to, we want to make more money and we want to have a great uh, marriage relationship. We want to have a great relationship with our kids and our parents and we want to have a, a, a good job so that we can be happy. Who doesn't want to be happy in life? I think that those are good words, uh, but when we get to heaven and we stand before God, I think that there's another word that would absolutely change your life if, if we were able to achieve this word. Because when we get before God, he is not going to say, well done, my good and successful servant. He's not going to say, well done, my good and influential servant. Boy, you were influential. I mean, 200 million followers. Nobody's ever done that before. You were influential. He's not going to say even, well done, my good and happy servant. What's he going to say? He's going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. My good and faithful servant. We're in a series called Decide. And today's message is called One Word That Will Change Your Life. One Word That Will Change Your Life. And I think it's a word... This word faithful is a word that we don't think about a lot. It's a word that we think, yeah, it's, that would be good to, to, to be faithful. It's kind of good, but it's not as important as being successful. It's not as important as being influential. It's not as important as being happy. And what we don't understand is that this word here is the foundation of everything else in life. It's what God wants us to be. So in this series, Decide, what we're really talking about is pre-deciding. In other words, we're talking about deciding before we get into the position where we have to make a decision. Come on, somebody. Why? Because we know that the quality of our decisions determine the quality of our life. The quality of your decisions, I said, determines 
the quality of your life. If you don't like where you are right now in life, maybe look back at some of the decisions that you've made. Come on. And I know that I know we can't control everything. We don't control where we're born, what family we're born into, what side of the tracks we're born on. If we're born a man or a woman, we don't control that because we're created. I'm here to tell you in this town, you were created a certain thing the way God wanted to create you. We don't control that. OK, I know all of those things. But where we are in life is made up in large part by the decisions that we have made. The quality of your decisions determines the quality of your life. And so out of that, we kind of came up with this phrase that you, most of you who have been here for uh, these messages would know by now, uh, that when we get into a certain situation, we want to pre-decide what we're going to do before we're in that situation. So when we're faced with whatever situation it is, we would say to ourselves, I have pre-decided, I've already decided that this is the choice I'm going to make. This is how I'm going to act. This is what I'm going to do. I have already pre-decided this week that when I get a hankering for ice cream on Friday, that I'm only going to have one scoop. Come on, somebody. I pre-decided that. <laughs> So that way, when I'm tempted and when I'm in that situation, I'm not denying myself the ice cream, but I already know I'm just going to have one scoop. I've already decided that. Come on, somebody. Pre-decide. That way, when you're in the situation, you're not taken by surprise, right? I don't have to make a decision off the cuff. I pre-decided. And with this, we're learning to be six things, six I am statements. And I want us to say these together, these six statements, beginning with ready. The first week we talked about ready. So I want us all to say these together. Come on, let's say them together. I am ready. I am consistent. I am. I am. I am faithful. And I am a finisher. I am a finisher. Today we're going to talk about being faithful. Faithful. Why is it so important to harp on being faithful? Why do you have to have a message about being faithful? Why is there a sermon about one little scripture, one little word about being faithful? I'll tell you why we're doing a whole message on being faithful. It's because being faithful is not easy. You don't become faithful by accident. Come on, somebody. You might think that, oh, I'm just a faithful person. But you don't become faithful by accident. It's never accidental to become faithful. You have to work at it day by day, week by week, year by year, decade by decade in order to become faithful. In order to become faithful, it takes time. It takes effort. It takes failure. It takes getting back up. It takes being forgiven. It takes being able to forgive. Why is it so hard? Because the trajectory of our life really gravitates toward those things that are easy. Come on. If you just, if you just leave things alone, you'll gravitate toward those things that are easy. I've used this analogy so many times, but it's so apropos when we talk about life. And that is the analogy of you being out on a boat, out on a lake, and you don't have any oars, and you don't have a sail, and you don't have a motor, right? And there's very little wind. And if you stay out on that boat in the middle of the lake and you take a two-hour nap, I guarantee you that when you wake up, you're not going to be in the same place that you started out when you began to take the nap. You're going to wake up and you're going to look around and say, well, how did I get over here in this cove? How did I get down uh, on this side of the lake? I didn't row. I didn't have a sail. It's because the waves of the water, though they are very slight, even though there's not much wind, is going to take you where it wants to take you unless you put your oar in the water and go the way you want to go. Unless you fire up that engine, unless you control the sails, it's going to take you where it wants you to go. And I liken that lake to life. Life is going to take you where it wants you to go unless you put your oar in the water. The trajectory of your life is going to go toward what is easy in life. Come on. Doing right is not easy. It's not easy because it comes with a cost. Look at Habakkuk chapter 2. 
verse 4. I'm going to show you this out of the New Living Translation. Uh, but I think this is, again, apropos for, for life for us today. The prophet Habakkuk repeated the words of the Lord. He said, look at, look at the proud. They trust in themselves and their lives are crooked. Look at the proud. They trust in themselves and their lives are crooked. But the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. The just shall live by faith. That's what that means. The righteous will live. It doesn't mean they do righteous things every once in a while. It doesn't mean that every once in a while they're going to do something good and give the person on the corner five bucks and feel good about their life. Every once in a while they'll come to church and sing a few songs and feel like, well, I'm good today. I can check that off my list. That's going to keep me for a while. Every once in a while they'll do some good deed. It says the righteous shall live. They will live, live, live by their faithfulness to God. Live by their faithfulness to God. What does it mean to be faithful? What does that mean to be faithful? Well, how do we live it out? Jesus talked about it. Jesus talked about faithfulness. First of all, he, he, he talked about how faithfulness can be shown in the way that you treat people. The way that you treat people shows your faithfulness to God, not just the faithfulness to people. You know, this, this, this phrase, this cliche that we get from Scripture, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Treat others the way that you want to be treated. If you break down those few words and that simple phrase, that little passage, that little verse, what you won't find in the verse is any exceptions. In other words, Jesus didn't say, Treat people the way that they treat you. You're probably saying, well, wait, that is what he said, isn't it? That sounds like, no, that's not what he said. He did not say treat people the way that they treat you, yet that's what we hear, that's what we do. Even if we hear something different, that's a lot of times what we do. But Jesus didn't say treat people the way they treat you. He said treat people the way you want to be treated. And there's nothing on the end of it that says unless... Unless they offend you. I know this is hard to hear. I told you. You thought I was joking when I said faithfulness is hard. I was joking around when I said we, 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 the trajectory of our life goes towards what is easy. It's just a little easier to treat people the way that they treat us. You want to know why? Because, listen, I get offended. I mean, if I, if I say hi to you four times in a row and you just turn away and never say hi to me, I'm saying, well, I ain't saying hi to you no more. Or if you need something, if you come and ask me for a favor, the first thing that comes to my mind is those four times you didn't say hi. That's what comes to mind because I'm a human being. Come on, somebody. I mean, maybe you're not human. Maybe you're superhuman. Maybe you can rise above that. But that's exactly what comes to my mind. So I got to work if I'm going to do what the Lord wants me to do and try to draw them into the kingdom by being a good witness. Come on, somebody. Treat others the way that you want them to treat you. So think about how do I want to be treated? When I offend somebody and don't know it, how do I want to be treated? How do I want to be treated? It's the way you treat people. Also, the way you steward your resources. How do you take care of what God has given you? Has, has God given you a gift? Has God given you a talent? Are you able to sing? How come you're not singing? Can you write? How come you're not writing? Can you administrate? You need to administrate something. You good with business? Stop sitting on the couch. Figure it out. It don't, it don't happen overnight. We got the internet now. I don't know if y'all know that. We can, we can figure it out. You can take classes. Start your business. See, a lot of times people feel like, you know, that when I'm in business, that's just, that's in the secular realm and that's not really, you know, honoring God. 
listen, your business honors God. Because it's not about the business, it's about you. <laughs> you follow God. And so that integrity and that uh, morality and those ethics. You know, I, I was listening to a podcast one time and it was talking about business ethics. How, how people, uh, how, how they display their ethics in business. And I began to think about this. I said, you know what? This podcast is not right. See, y'all think podcasts are right just because it's a podcast. Anybody can make a podcast. I said, this, this ain't right. I said, there's no such thing as business ethics. You're either ethical or you're not. It, you don't become ethical at business and then at home you're not ethical. You know what that means? You're not ethical. There's no such thing as business ethics. What, how, do you, how do you take care of what God has given you? Did, he, did you have a clunker of a car? Well, it should be the cleanest clunker on the road. And it should be full of gas. Just because it's a clunker don't mean you keep it on E. You make it, you're the one making it more of a clunker. And you need to get the oil changed. Take care of that thing. Take care of what God gave you. Take care of what he gave you. And then how you respond to God. How do you respond to God when he speaks to you, when he puts you in certain situations? Because there's a lot of times when we know what is right and the Lord is speaking to us. And we say, I don't, I don't know about that, Lord. You know, I'm just, I'm just human and I got to do what I got to do. And we use all, these, all this slang and all these excuses and God don't want to hear it. He don't want to hear it. I knew you before I formed you in the womb. I know what you're capable of. I've given you my spirit. I've given you my name. You have everything you need. There are no excuses. I know it's hard. I, listen, I said it. It's doing right is hard. Being faithful is not. Listen, faithfulness ain't easy. It's not easy. But we're able to do it because God's grace is upon us. So I want to give you three ways that we can pre-decide. Three pre-decisions uh, that we can uh, make in our lives in order to be faithful. In order to be faithful. Number one, here's what we have to understand. Here's what we have to understand. Every interaction that we have, that you have, is an opportunity to add value. Pre-decide that every situation you're in, you're going to add value to that situation. When you come into the room, I used to have a friend when I was in the Army, and when we were in uh, AIT, it was a hard way to go. I mean, we were learning things. We were going out to the gun range. We had, to, we had our, 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 we called them Alice packs at the time, but our, backs, our backpacks on. And, you know, they weighed, you know, weighed about as much as I did. We weighed 100 pounds, and we had to walk nine miles out to the range. We had to do all this stuff and, and shoot and uh, do push-ups and go through obstacle courses. And it was just, I mean, from 5 in the morning till 9 at night when lights were out, it was just, it was just a physical a weight on our shoulders, you know, we just, it was just always doing something, always learning, always getting yelled at, come on, and this guy was always smiling, he just, he was always, we'd be tired, I mean, tears coming out of our eyes, slobber coming out of our mouth, I know that's gross, but we'd be so tired, we didn't care, and he just over there smiling, what's up, Carter, you doing all right today, and I said, man, how is it that you're always smiling? He said, listen, he said, we go through enough stuff in life. He said, so when I come in the room, I don't bring nothing but love. He said, people be upset and, you know, going through stuff. He said, but when I come in, I don't bring nothing but love. And I said, that's what Jesus did. That's what a Christian should do. Whenever you come in the room, you should bring nothing but love into the room. Nothing but love. Nothing but love. Every person you meet, everyone you see is an opportunity to bless and add value. Add value. But we don't, that's not natural for us. Think about it. Here, here's how I can prove it to you. If we all got together and we took a picture, you already know where I'm going with it, don't you? We took a picture and then we put it up on the screen. All of us now. In fact, say it was 200 people. 500 people in the picture, and we put it up on the screen. Where would your eyes go to first? Don't lie to me. 
right to you. How do I look? It's natural. I'm not telling you you're wrong. I'm just saying it's a natural thing. It doesn't come natural for us to think about others first. That's why Jesus said that. Others first. It's not a natural thing for us. It's, it's human to look at yourself first. To look at yourself first. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, Paul said this to the church in Ephesus. He said, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. Unwholesome talk. That's not just cursing, that, but that also includes cursing. I'm so, I can't even watch, I, I can't even watch Netflix. I mean, the good wholesome shows they curse it on. Every Marvel movie got curse words in it. Come on. But he didn't just say, don't curse. I mean, look, it's all words. You, you're not, honestly, you're not offending me. You know, it's, it's just words. But the thing is, he said, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. But only, well, what's unwholesome talk? Well, let's keep going. What did he say? Only what's helpful for building others up according to their needs. Tell me that's easy. Tell me that's easy all the time to only say what's helpful to someone else according to their needs. Not what to their needs. Not what you want them to be. Because I can look around at people and I think, that person, you should be more like this. And, you, and I have the ways that I think people should be. But Paul said, according to their needs, build them up that it may benefit those who listen. That's what Paul is saying. When you walk into a room, the climate should be better. I didn't say the temperature should go up. I said the climate should be a pleasant climate, whatever that is. 75 degrees and sunny, little breeze. Come on. The climate should be better. You should make people better. Come on. I remember when I, when I came to this town, I was, a, I was a broken person. I had been a Christian for a long time even, and, and I, was, I was very broken. And I remember the pa my pastor uh, took me out to lunch, and I you know, kind of told him my story. And I was expecting, when I told him everything I'd gone through, especially being a Christian, this wasn't, I was out there and I didn't know God. I knew who God was and went through some stuff. And when I told him all this, I was just expecting him to say, well, you know, listen, you just got to sit down for a while and see what God does. And, you know, he's, he'll, he'll build you up. But, uh, you know, that's a lot that you've been through. You got to pay the consequences. And, you know, I was expecting all this stuff. And he simply said to me that God is not through with you. And when God anoints you, no man can stop it, not even you. I said, what? He said, you can't even stop what God has for you if you just give yourself to it. No matter what you've done, no matter what you've been, you think God didn't know you was going to go through that? Before he created you, he already knew. He, did, he knew what you was going to do before he created you and decided to love you anyway already knew. How many of us already can, 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 can forecast what someone's going to do and pre-decide that we're going to love them? That's what he's asking us to do. That's what he's saying to us. You see, Jesus, listen, when the disciples were so worried over in Matthew chapter 6, they were so worried about things, and then Jesus began to break it down. He said, look at the birds of the air. Look at the lilies of the field. Look at all this stuff. He said, you want to know what the answer is, guys? Stop worrying about everything. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. What did Jesus do? He brought value. Come on. Jesus encouraged. He lifted up. He didn't say, oh, you guys, y'all, how, how long do I have to be with you? Y'all continuing to worry? Y'all some sorry jokers. Because that's what I would have wanted to say. I would say, look, y'all some sorry jokers. How many times we, you didn't seen? We fed the 5,000. You still worrying? Sorry, jokers. No, he didn't do that. He said, don't worry. Don't worry. My favorite story in the Bible, the woman caught in adultery. Uh, remember when they threw her down before him? He didn't say, shame, 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 woman. What is wrong with you? Why did you do that? You didn't even close the curtains. They saw you. And now here you are. He didn't say any of that. He said, where are your accusers? 
She said, I have none, Lord. He said, then neither do I accuse you. Neither do I condemn you. He said, listen, here's what I'm going to tell you. Go and sin no more. In other words, I know what you did. I know what's behind you, but I'm not looking at what's behind you. I want to push you forward. Go and sin no more. Yo, but Lord, you don't know. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about that. I'm talking about going forward. That's what Jesus does. He encourages people. One of my, one of my, one of my other favorite encouragements was Peter. Now, come on. Peter saw just about every miracle Jesus did. His mother-in-law, right, was healed. Uh, what else? He, he, he saw a blind man's eyes open. He saw the woman with the issue of blood healed. He saw the woman who came and said, my daughter, my daughter is laying on the bed, demon sick. He saw first Jesus reject her, but he saw her persistence, and then he saw Jesus heal her daughter. He saw Jesus walking on water. He witnessed it. He witnessed Jesus walking on water. Oh, wait a minute. He got down out the boat and started walking on water. Peter walked on water. But when the rubber met the road, he denied him. Can you believe it? After going through all of that, he said, I don't know the blankety blank. He said, with cursings. I don't know what kind of cursings those was. Maybe sorry joker was a curse back then. I don't know the sorry joker. I don't know him. He denied Jesus. What did Jesus do? First, before he even talked to Peter, he said, go back and tell them that I am alive. Go back, tell my disciples and Peter. And then when he talked to Peter, he said, do you love me, Lord? You know, you know better than me. He said, feed my sheep. What did he do? He gave him a mantle. After he denied him, that's what he did. Come on. Every interaction, every opportunity is an opportunity to, to love and to build up and to add value. Secondly, every resource is an opportunity to multiply. Every resource you have is a great opportunity to multiply, folks. It's an opportunity to multiply. God did not make hoarders. Come on. He did not make hoarders. If you're a hoarder, God didn't do it. That's all you. God is not, God is not into hoarding. God is into giving. Giving generously and courageously. That's what God wants you to do. Come on. Every resource. You remember the parable of the talents, right? We don't have to go through it. One he gave five, one he gave three, one he gave one. And one of them said, listen, I don't know. I just better save it. But the ones who multiplied what he gave him, look at verse 21 of Matthew chapter 25. His master said, well done, good and what? Come on, somebody. He said, well done, good and what? He said, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in a few things, and now I'm going to put you in charge of many things. You was faithful with the hoopty car that you had. Some of y'all young people don't know hoopty. You was faithful with that crazy looking car that you had. You kept oil in it. You got the oil changed. You put gas in it. You kept it clean. Now I'm going to make you master over much. You was faithful with that little $24 that you had in your checking and $13 you had in your savings just to keep it open. You was faithful with that. Now I'm going to make you ruler of much. What makes you think that you can rule much? Everybody's waiting to win the lotto. Everybody's waiting to get a big payday before they become generous or before they become faithful or before they have integrity. But God said, if you can't be faithful over little, 
then that's all you're going to get. It's all you're going to get. Multiply it. Do what God asks you to do. Because in verse 25 and 26 of Matthew chapter 25, the, the guy said, I was afraid and I went out and hid your gold in the ground. And here, this is what belongs to you. You know what Jesus said to him? How many know what Jesus said to him? You know what he said to him? He didn't say, thanks, I appreciate you holding that for me. Appreciate that. It's good, no problem. You gave me back what I gave you. I don't expect anything more. It's not what he said. He said, you wicked and lazy servant. You wicked and lazy servant. How many in here want to be called a wicked and lazy servant? Come on, don't raise your hands. Nobody wants to be called a wicked and lazy servant. Well, the only way that you avoid that is to multiply what God gave you. Think about what God gave you. You need to multiply it. We need to be faithful. Every interaction is an opportunity to add value, and every resource is an opportunity to multiply. And finally, every prompting is an opportunity from God. Don't let it go by. If the Lord is prompting you to do something, do it. If God is prompting you to do something, do it. I was listening to uh, another pastor uh, talk this past week, and he was saying that he and his wife, they were actually on a missions trip, and they were busy, like the whole trip. And then they had like two hours of downtime, and uh, they, they decided just to go outside in the sun, wherever they were, and just to sit and, and talk and just kind of recharge just for a couple of hours. And he said the Lord put on his heart to call uh, his friend back in the States. And he told his wife that. She said, well, you better call him. So uh, they were about uh, 20 minutes away from a phone, and they had to walk there. So now they're taking at least 40 minutes of their down, two-hour downtime just in walking back to the phone, uh, not, not including how long he's going to be on the phone talking to his friend. He doesn't even know why. He just felt like the Lord told him to do it. But he forgot what the time was. There's a time difference, and it was midnight back in the States where his friend was, and he forgot about that. So he called him. When his friend picked up the phone, his friend said, why are you calling me now at this time? And then he realized, he said, oh, I forgot it's midnight. He said, I'm sorry, man. I forgot. I just feel like the Lord told me to call you. He said, no, no, no. Why right now? Why in this moment? Why are you calling me right now? And his voice was shaking. And he said, I just felt like the Lord told me to call you. What's going on? Man was about to commit suicide. He was done. He was done. And his, and, and his pastor said, well, what, what are you doing? He said, you got a gun? He said, yeah, I got a gun. You know I have a gun. And I, I, was, I was ready. I was just about to do it. He said something, to, and I wasn't even going to pick up the phone, but something told me to pick up the phone. We know what that something, who that something is. Come on, somebody. Now, I'm not telling you everything in your life will be that dramatic, but when there's a prompting of the Lord, be obedient. See, God said to obey is better than to sacrifice. You know, we have this saying that I just, you know, I just ask for forgiveness. I'm just going to do it and ask for forgiveness later. We love to do that. But God is saying, listen, I, I, don't, I don't want your I'm sorry. I'd rather have your I'll do it. Jesus told the story uh, of two young men. And uh, I won't go to it, I'll, but he told the story of two young men and their father asked him to do something. And the first one said, I'm not doing that. And he went all his way and didn't do it. And the, and the second one said, oh, okay, I'll do it. But then he never did it. But then the first one went back later and said, I better do it. And he did it. And he said, who was justified? It was the first one because he ended up obeying. He did what his father told him to do. To obey is better than to sacrifice. Every prompting is an opportunity to obey God. Paul said this in Acts chapter 20, verse 22. He said, and now, watch this now. He said, compelled by the Spirit... I am going to Jerusalem, watch this now, not knowing what will happen to me there. In other words, what, what we want so often is the big picture before we're going to do anything. Somebody tells you to do something, it's like, hold on now, now tell me, explain to me everything that's happening here. I mean, I'm going to go down there and then what's going to happen? They're going to be there and then they're going to tell me something and then keep on going. I need to know everything before I just take a step. 
But following God, a lot of times he don't tell you everything. He told Abraham, just go. Go where? Go to a place I will show you. Read it in Genesis. I'm not going to tell you where it is. You'll know it. Go to a place that I will show you. And can I just tell you this? When you're following God, when you have a relationship with God, you don't need him to tell you every single detail. You ever, you ever went into a store? I'm finishing up. You ever went into a store and you know that you wanted to, to, to buy something? Maybe you needed some new shoes or a new shirt or you're buying something for somebody else. Come on. It's their birthday, whatever it is. And you, you say, I don't know exactly what I'm, I'm going I'm to get. And you, and you go into the store. And what happens when you go into the store? A lot of times, somebody comes right up to you. How Can I help you? Is there anything I can help you with? Can I help you? And, and you say, uh, you, no, I'm just looking, which is a nice way of saying, go away. <laughs> go away. And then, and then they say, well, you know, I, I, could, I could probably help you. I could probably help you if I just know what you're looking for. And you say, I don't really know what I'm looking for, but I'll know it when I see it. And that's what following God is like. I'll know it when I see it. I don't need to know the end from the beginning. He knows that. But I'll know it when I see it. I'll know it when I see it. Every interaction is an opportunity to add value. Every resource is an opportunity to multiply. And every prompting is an opportunity to obey God. He's not going to say, well done, my good and successful servant, although he wants you to be successful, by the way. By the way. By the way. God makes rich and adds no sorrow to it. He wants you to be successful. All right? He's not going to say, well done, my good and influential servant servant. Although he wants you to be influential. Relational evangelism, folks. You ain't got to be up here preaching or out on the street preaching. You got to live an integrous life. And when you get an opportunity, praise God in front of the sinner. That's, that's all. That's what God wants you to do. So yeah, he wants you to be influential, but he's not going to say, well done, my good and influential servant. And he's not going to say even, well done, my good and happy servant. And don't think that God doesn't want you to be happy. Of course he does. In the presence of the Lord is the fullness of joy. And at his right hand, come on somebody, there are pleasures evermore. So yeah, he wants you to be happy. But the way to all of those things is one word, faithful. Faithful. My pastor used to say, Michael, I need you to do three things for me. Three things. I need you to be faithful, faithful, faithful. If you are faithful, all the rest will come.